Oaks. So let's get started. Um, so I'll look at a quick background to Victorian education. Um, Prior to 1837, education was, without any doubt, mainly for the privileged. Um, rich children would be taught at home, usually by a governess, typically who was an unmarried woman, which is why female teachers today are referred to as Miss, generally. So it's always Miss this, Miss that, I know that, I like. Um, around 8 to 11, boys might go to a public school then if they were parents were wealthy enough, but girls tended to be continued to be educated. Was of course charged money to teach children and they were very expensive um, almost prohibitively so for anyone other than gentry or wealthy industrialists um, for poor children the only chance of education came via the charity schools um, these were schools funded by gifts or usually left in wills or endowments which is money income from investments um, and they usually charity shoes schools would usually buy clothes for the children to attend the school blue coats were the typical in this and um, we've got local examples in Gloucestershire to Tommy Richards's school and also the Bisley blue coat school um, the subjects taught were generally quite simple reading writing and arithmetic as they used to say the three r's plus religious instruction and this rather nice picture uh, it's at gloucester museum service art collection um it's the blue coat school at gloucester which is by john john kemp um rather nice picture and you can see it's got some idea of sort of the uniforms that the children would be wearing notice they're all boys uh, here's an example of somebody giving some money to start such a school. This is the will of a chap called Thomas Merritt, who died in Tewkesbury in 1724. It's a rather scrappy will, as you can say. You've got the usual things you have in will. You've got a preamble at the top, the main body of the will, the rest of it, and then a last bit at the bottom. Um, so the relevant points in this are, um, as you can see in the a little bit of the transcription, I, Thomas Merritt of Tewkesbury in the county of Gloucester, being weak in body, but a perfect mind and memory do make and ordain this my last will as followeth and he goes on to give some information out about what he wants to do with his estate and about three quarters of the way down where the red arrow points to you'll see this uh, this paragraph and as to the rest and residue of all and any personal and real estate i give and bequeath to my loving sisters catherine hartlebury and barbara light paying yearly 50 shillings per annum to the use of the charity school of Tewkesbury. It witness i have set my hand and seal this 25th day of july 1724 so you know 50 shillings in 1724 is a reasonable sum of money to be given to a school. Uh, another example, um, this is the, uh, the gift of a Frances Hopton, Mrs. Frances Hopton of Cam, and in Wood of 1730, she gave something different. She gave the land called Draycott Farm, with the rents and profits thereof, to build a good and substantial schoolroom, with apartments for a master and mistress, to instruct ten poor boys and ten poor girls, the master to teach the boys reading, writing and drawing accounts, and the mistress to instruct the girls in reading, knitting and sewing. The master and mistress mistress to live in the house rent free and the salary to the master being nine pound yearly and to the mistress five pound yearly the children to be of parents living in the parish of cam chosen by the trustees to be taught on the school to the age of 14. Um, what i find interesting about this one is really the subject matter for the boys uh, reading writing and draw, or drawing up accounts they're basically teaching them how to run farms what they need to know and the accounts for farm are quite important but it's also interesting that they've actually she's actually stressed she wants girls to be educated as well which again 1730 this is a really really good foresighted will Sunday school movement um 1780 Robert Rates who's the owner of the Gloucester Journal newspaper began the Sunday school movement um it offered free education from young boys from the slums in Gloucester and was held on a Sunday the reason being of course because most boys were at work and they worked weekdays um later on they also accepted girls and by 1831 so okay it's 50 years later roughly or 60 years later um Sunday schools were teaching approximately 1.25 million children across Britain, which was 10% of the nation's population at the time. So it's an amazingly far-sighted idea. It's actually began to set education as a sort of, you know, this is something we must do for our year one. You must educate these people. 
Um, some schools were set up by what was known as voluntary subscription. Um, wealthy patrons might pay for the building and running of a school at their own expense. And in Gloucestershire, the great badminton C of E school was set up by the Duke of Beaufort. Um, or local people could raise money to build a school and then pay an annual subscription to meet the costs. Uh, Newnham on Seven School fell into this category. And two national organisations existed to help these schools. Um, the first one was the National Society for Promoting the Education of the Poor in the Principles of the Established Church in England and Wales. These were known as the National Schools. And there's a lovely picture there of Yate National School, which if you go to Yate today, you can still see this building perfectly intact. It looks like it just stepped right out of that, that picture. The other body, this was the British and Foreign School Society, known as the British Schools. And largely, the, these were the sort of the non-conformist schools. Um, they argued that, you know, why should we pay for the Church of England to teach people when we don't believe in that church? So there is this other school organisation set up. And this is a rather nice photograph of the British School at Ebley. Um, most voluntary schools charged a small fee, it's called school pence, um, and this is an example we have from the Bybury School. The rate varied, but it's typically thruppence, 57p in today's money for the first child, reductions given for others of the same family. Um, you know, and at this time, typical farm workers, well, they worked about 50, you know, they got about 15 shillings a week, about 34 quid today. So school fees amounted to about 2% of their income, which, you know, which is a nice small amount for them to pay. And I'll just give you a second here to have a look at that, that one, which is, which is an interesting little leaflet. So there's a school pence. Not everyone, however, wanted education for children. And this is a rather good letter from, you can imagine being a rather grumpy local farmer, Mr. T. Bailey in the par parish of Barclay, who wrote to the vicar in 1882. Dear sir, I received your letter and I'm sorry to inform you, I do not agree with the agricultural labourers' children being kept at school so many years. From my own experience, it makes them very idle. They do not, as a rule, take to work afterwards. I know of arguments for and against education. I will give you a few shillings to give away at Christmas to a few deserving old people. I think that will do more good. You know, great. You know, he, you know, he's obviously set in his ways. He can't see that point of educating. Um, luckily, he was in the minority, and as time passed, he really did become in the minority. Um, 1830, the government began paying grants to help fund the building and running of schools. Um, although for the first 30 years, schools had to find their own money via school pence. From 1863, then the government decided to help pay annual running costs. But to get the funding, schools had to allow government inspections. There's something, you never get something for nothing from the government. Um, and the amount of funding every school received was dependent on certain things. Firstly, pupil attendance. For every pupil in regular attendance, they got four shillings. Um, then they got pupil performance. Payment was by results. For every pupil who passed a uh, uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, they got eight shillings, which is quite good. And then in 1895, they finally decided that, you know, this probably wasn't the best way of doing it. And these fundings were replaced by a straight grant with no strings attached, which made it much easier. And, you know, schools could be assured, could be assured of getting an, an income. Um, the Elementary Ed Education Act 1870, commonly known as Forces Education Act, um, Great legislation set the framework for the schooling of all children between the ages of five and 13 in England and Wales. It was, it was a really good reforming act. Um, drafted by William Forster, there's a lovely picture of him there from the National Portrait Gallery. Um, he was a Liberal MP and it was introduced on the 17th of February 1870 after campaigning by the National Education League. Um, one of the perceived Needs, needs for the reasons for the need for this was Britain had to remain competitive and it had to remain at the forefront of agriculture if we wanted to retain our place at the lead being what we thought was the lead country of the world and you know they wanted to invest in education it was seen as a good way of achieving it um you know and it sort of still is today except you know not with the same sort of fervor of these people were looking at these these reforms so getting on to the actual 
records themselves what have we got well we've got three main types of records surviving in this time so we've got the admission registers we've got the log books and we've got the punishment books and we'll look at all these in turn however as all these things there are various caveats to be careful of um, all these records today are subject to provisions of the data protection act 2018 the freedom of information act 2000 and the environmental information regulation is 2004 boiled down it means that log books or admission registers less than 100 years old may not be viewed without completing the research undertaken form you just got to fill a form in and then you can see it um, however punishment books are subject to are subject access only until they are 101 years old so really you can only look at those if you have a real need and you've got a direct relative um, if you do think you fall into these categories have a chat with us and we, we know we can see what happens so let's have a look admission registers um, you see on this picture, it's a typical admission register. They're fairly large, fairly thin books. You know, they open up to a double page and the information starts on one side and goes all the way across the top to the other. Um, they recorded the administrative details of a child in school. They are not the daily attendant registers, which we get marked at. They're generally not retained by archives. It has to be said, most schools don't retain them more than a year or two anyway. Um, but the admission registers provide quite a good lot of information. The child's admission number, the date of admission, the child's full name, the name of the parent or guardian, their address, any religious exemptions, date of birth, the child's last school, if there was one, the date of the child leaving the school, the cause of the leaving, and lastly, any, any remarks that the headmaster wanted to do. Um, and here's a, you know, a couple of entries there. I'll just let you have a quick look at that while I have a little slurp, like Keith, Keith Floyd used to say. Sadly, this is water, not wine. So you can have a look at this one. You can get the general gist. So you get here, so for example, the top of the page, 249, date of admission was 20th of 4th, 1914. Name of the child, Christopher Hudman. Uh, name of the parent was William. They came from the green at Twinning. And then you read across on the bottom picture, date of birth was the 4th of March, 1910. No last school, so it's the child's first attendance. When they last left, attended school, 29th of July, 1920. So it's a you know, good education at the time. Uh, Cause of leaving, got a war scholarship. So, you know, obviously it was quite a clever pupil and went to Tewkesbury High School. So you can see the school was quite proud of this one. Um, these from these books can tell us quite a bit of things. Um, this is an interesting example. This is the Twinning School Register for 1912 to 1943. Um, you know, it starts off quite normal, but you'll notice the set of names on the left hand side here, Johannes Bergamo, Jacobus Bergamo, Josephine Bergamo, and they were staying at Puckrup Farm, but you look sort of across the page, or in this case just beneath it, and they were Belgian refugees. Um, they were from Antwerp, and we tend to forget, you know, refugees at the start of the First World War, when the Germans invaded Belgium and Holland, there are lots of refugees trying to flood over to escape. And again, so this can be recorded in, in, in these, log, in these uh, registers. So logbooks. Um, these are the equivalent of ship's logs, really, and they record the day-to-day -day activity at the school. Um, they can be extremely interesting. They can sort of information can cover all sorts of all sorts of things. Um, when you get to read them, you'll notice they are obsessed with pupil attendance, government inspections, religious inspections, and the weather. Um, handwriting can be an issue. And the other thing is, some heads record everything in great detail, some record absolutely nothing. And it's that's something that's really surprising. You can read one logbook, it's got masses of information, the next logbook, nothing. So it can, they can, be, it can be frustrating as well. So what we're going to do in this section, we're just going to pick up some general themes through logbooks and, and show you lots of examples. Um, usually they're pro forma printed, the large in lines and page numbers. And this is a typical logbook. This is the beginning of the Christchurch Boys' School in Cheltenham, opened on 1st of May, 1863. Um, and it's got, you can see, is the column on the left with the year. It's got the day and the date exactly. And then you've got the comments on the right. So this is the format you're looking at. This is quite an easy one to read, have to say. Um, and already you'll notice halfway down, you get... Um, how many pupil attendances, the, the, the percentages, things like that. So present in the morning on the 11th, there are 58. In the afternoon, there are 66. And logbooks generally repeat this theme. 
there's a typical page in this same logbook, cut the pages in. Um, it, we're lucky on this one as the headmaster has actually continued his fine writing. It's a very good hand to read this one, although obviously due to the small size of it, this this it's hard to read now. Um, this one crops up again later, so we won't, I'll, but we won't dawdle on it. We've got lots lots to see. So look at the themes then. Let's have a look at some. Okay, examinations. Um, this is this is um, one from a logbook. Um, on some of these, I have to apologise because we normally try and give the reference numbers for them. Some of these were the reference numbers were not attached to the pictures. Some were. So some of these, I'm afraid, we don't know exactly what school they came from, although we know we do have them. Um, I like this one. Examination of standards one, two and three work fairly good on the whole. Some weak ones. All children were interested in the growth of plants and seeds, also in birds and insects and nature generally, brackets, especially queen wasps. So you wonder what are they? They've obviously had a big wasp nest at the school. And, you know, the, this is the head's way of telling it. Um, the standards were set by government. And if you look on the Internet and you put school standards one, two, three and four, you will get an example of what they were looking for. It all depended how well they could read, how well they could do sums etc there are various various sort of qualifications um, religious respections also took place um, religious education was quite a contentious issue for the 1870 education act um, and non-conformists so the methodists and congregationists etc etc forced the point that only non-denominational instruction should be given otherwise local ratepayers and taxpayers money was effectively being spent on the church of england and their idea was well, why should they get this money spent when we can't so as a result all state schools were non-denominational and in practice they simply taught the bible and a few hymns which the non-conformists were happy with you can see this uh, headmasters um rm mason is a little bit more scrappy to be honest and it's quite a hard read and there are some big words in there that even i don't really want to try and pronounce so looking at attendance, again, I said before, always a primary feature. And the reason for this was that, say, prior to 1985 and the grants, schools income was, would, would derive the numbers of people attending and therefore more pupils, more money. It's a little bit like that today, I feel. Um, here's a couple of examples. I'll just give you a little second to read them. So you'll notice on the bottom, especially um, attendance again bad this week owing to sickness. Many of the children are away and we'll look at that in a minute as to what that could be. Um, absences always disliked, especially unofficial, unofficial ones. Um, and again, they hear attendant not quite so good. Children are now and again taken to the doctor by parents, presumably without telling them to school. Um, uh, this one here, average attendance, 91%. Charlie Orr has been away this week for no reason whatsoever. So this is, you know, poor old Charlie, when he comes back, he's going to get a good talking to, isn't he? Um, I love this one. Some heads faced a losing battle. This head, a Cheltenham school, recorded a rummage sale, um, which attracted many parents and caused poor attendance as the children were used as babysitters. I got babysitters there, it's very bad. So Friday, rummage sale at the park. Many children away in the afternoon minding baby. So, you know, it's, some, some heads just can't help it. Holidays, very often given down, often you can hear the relief as the teacher writes it, um, and they often record half days, which were given for a variety of reasons, which we'll see as we go through. Um, this one's interesting, this gives you a Whitsuntide and an assemblance after Whitsuntide, and the bottom one mentions a half holiday in order to prepare the school for the sale of work week, which sounds interesting. Summer holidays, we all know and love them. Um, and again, so you got, they got various names, harvest holidays, summer holidays, um, you know, the relief from the headmasters, five weeks away, it's going to be good, isn't it? Um, I like this one as well. Some August closed school this morning for the summer holiday, annual school treat at the park in the afternoon, bracket summer holiday and massive letters. Obviously, the headmaster was really looking forward to his break at this year. 1913, gosh, what's he got to come up with next year? He's not going to enjoy that summer term, is he? Uh, religious holidays again these are noted quite frequently so easter holidays christmas holidays um you know you get this thing happening all the time they would note it some again not all do some do it's interesting 
special holidays, Empire Day, um, celebration of Queen Victoria's birthday on the 24th of May. It was renamed Empire Day in 1902 after her death in 1901. Um, it's 19, it was renamed Commonwealth Day in 1966 and still celebrated as that today, um, although the date was changed in 1977 to the second Monday in March. Um, and again, it was marked as quite an interesting event. And I'll just give you a second to read this one. This is quite an interesting one. So what do you think about it? So what I particularly like about this one, it's a couple of two things, really. Um, I like the fact the rector spoke to the children and parishioners on the empire as one of the steps in God's plan for the union of all peoples through the League of Nations. How far wrong were they? Um, but I also like the way in which the, the plaiting of the maypole was obviously done really well. The headmaster was obviously very impressed by this. Um, this was well done. The way in which the difficulties of varying sizes of the children in a small school were got over was excellent. The simple costumes were effective and quite inexpensive. Mrs Warner is to be much congratulated on the success of the celebration. I just think it's wonderful. <coughs> We've got another one here uh, for another school. This is a little bit briefer. This is the programme for the day. Um, Empire Day observed. The following was the programme. Hymn, 165 A and M. Oh God, our help. Hoisting of the flag, followed by saluting of the flag, followed by the first verse of God save the king. Then it's cheers for the motherhood. A recitation of Empire Day, a song, ye gentlemen of England, not quite empire, is it England, but there you go, uh, addressed by the head teacher, that's the bit nobody was looking forward to, I would imagine, followed by the song Men of Harlech, um, then the march past the flag and each child was to salute. And then there is God Save the King, three verses. But at the end of it, every child on leaving received the bun and they had a half day holiday. So that's not too bad, you know. Listening to the headmaster prattle on for an hour or two was probably just about treat for the bun, I think. Um, Armistice Day. It's actually mentioned far less than you might expect. Um, obviously, you know, it's not going to be prior to 1921, 1920, um, really. Um, but also the fact that, you know, it was generally was observed 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, whatever weekday it fell on, and it, there was a two minute silence. But not very many heads actually record this. I think I've only spotted it in about two or three logbooks. But this is an interesting one. This actual entry comes from 1918, and it records the actual day that the guns fell silent, and so the school was closed. You read here, November the 12th, the vicar visited the school this morning and arranged for the school to be closed this afternoon on hearing the news that the armistice had been signed. So this is the following day after the armistice was signed, the word had spread and they decided to give the children a half day holiday, um, obviously hoping that any relatives might come back to them. The weather. Uh, this is a perennial favourite. It's always in logbooks. Um, usually only a couple of lines. Sometimes you get more information. So here we have for Cheltenham Christ School, 1874 June. Weather very stormy. Typical British summer, really. Um, and then January 15th, the all school in 1926. I went to the heavy snowstorm. The attendance has been very poor all day. The monotress was unable to come through because of the weather. Percentage for the week, 75. Percent, or oh, that's not very many, is it? Thunderstorms often recorded in great detail for an odd reason. Um, and here you see on 1910, the 11th of the month, I'm not sure which one, it, what month it is, um, very heavy rain with thunder about half past eight and the attendance suffered, but not so nearly as much as anticipated. So this headmaster from Western Sub Edge School, north of the Cotswolds there, um, was quite surprised, very bad thunderstorm, but you know, he thought, oh, nobody's gonna come to school today because of it, but they got a few attending, so he's quite pleased. This is another one, again, for the same school in 1910. Um, <laughs> it's interesting the fact the uh, vicar visited and gave a sermon, scripture sermon whilst the lower division was at drill. This afternoon there came a very sudden and awful 
very heavy thunder both several children fell to the ground others rushed to the schoolroom much tact required to quiet them they were so frightened so that must have been some some event frightened all these children um you know and it's they must have been absolutely terrified and we do know sometimes you get a thunder clap of thunder it can be awful um, snow and ice, that's a very common one, especially in rural areas where they often really did affect travel. Um, a couple of entries here from that, both from Amni Crucis in consecutive years. Um, a perfect attendance, notwithstanding a snowstorm. And then you have another day on a Friday, a snowstorm in the morning between eight and nine, and the attendance was not so good. And again, more snow. This is from Leighton, so down in the south of the county here, South Gloucestershire. The Tresham children not come today owing to the roads being covered with ice. And then next, a little below that on February the 5th, owing to a heavy fall of snow, there has been no school. So these things have happened. And again, again, below that in March, school closed due to heavy snow. 17 children at school, not very many at all. Um, you did get damage from these storms, and Amni Crucis features in this again. We looked at it earlier. Um, yesterday, there was a severe thunderstorm followed by a hailstone. One of the school windows was damaged, and the schoolhouse was flooded. So, imagine how powerful that storm must have been to actually break a window. That's something we don't hear of now today at all, very rarely, anyway. Um, obviously, flooding, we do get still get flooding. Um, farm work, again, it features quite heavily. Um, schools frequently allow children to leave the schools in order to help with that cultural events such as harvest and haymaking, which of course are often community events anyway, so whole villages would turn out. Um, and this head here is noted when a boy who'd been excused for haymaking had returned to school. If you look at the date, June 1915, you know, it becomes doubly important because many of the men had actually gone to war and more of the children were being used for actually haymaking and harvest. And again, this is another one for the Amni Crucis School. Um, this, I think, is a very, very interesting entry for Western Sub Edge School. Um, the attendance were not so good. Several children gone gleaning at the knoll. Now, gleaning, it was just the act of collecting leftover crops from farmers' field after it had been harvested, was very often practiced in rural areas and was crucial in helping families get enough food for winter. And as you can see from these pictures, one from the Bundes archive and one's a famous painting by Jean Francois Millet, 1857. You can see people actually just going through the fields, picking up bits of corn and wheat that they found there, you know, and you can think that's what they need to get through the winter. How hard must their lives have been? Um, come to war work, um, during World War I, the government's food production department introduced a scheme inviting schools in six counties to let their pupils collect hedgerow fruit for money. Um, the fruit was basically collected and then processed into jam preserves for the forces. And this has cropped up in several Gloucestershire schools. Uh, there's a couple of entries here from various ones. A very bright afternoon, some children away current picking, and then another from a different school to different hand, school clothes for children to pick blackberries for the army and navy. Um, here's a school they've really gotten into it. Rural schools had a bit of an advantage, but you know, city schools also took part. Some were more enthusiastic than others. This school is obviously very keen for it. Um, school had a half holiday each afternoon for blackberrying. Um, it gives you how much the girls collected. Half day in blackberrying, another half day, another half day, another half day. Lots of it there. Um, down at the bottom, more days off black blackberrying. A lot of lot, lot of blackberries were picked. Have to be said. And this was reported. In the, this is reported in the Miniature Education Committee for Gloucester County Council. Um, they actually recorded it. And this is really interesting. The chairman recorded that in accordance with a special request made by Food Production Department. Um, schools in Gloucestershire went blackberry in. It had been taken up by 223 schools and they gathered 81 tons, 1900 weight, 14 pounds of blackberries and sent to jam factories. Um, the food production people have paid for this and Gloucester schools received the grand total of £1,270, which was distributed to the schools who collected the most. Um, two schools got over 30 and 35, and these were substantial amounts of money back then, a couple of thousand pounds, 230, 35 was. So a lot of schools got made a lot of money out of this, which was, you know, it's a really good bonus for them. 
Looking at medical events, um, schools were vital in maintaining the health of children, especially in the Victorian period. Um, illness and sickness could spread through communities and schools very quickly, and the logbooks often recorded such outbreaks due to the effect on attendance. Um, and schools, you know, they could be closed um, by the health authorities and children could be excluded. Um, we have this lovely image here uh, from a collection in the archives of Nurse Wolf in a Gotherington with their little donkey trap there, which is really nice. I love that picture. Um, we all remember Nitty Nora, I'm sure we do at school. Nit nurse coming to check check yourself and you'd be turned up and have your hair come through. Boys were normally luckier than girls. We tend to have short hair, required less shirt searching. You know, I often remember the girls in front of me at school with their nurse jamming this knit comb through their hairs. It's terrible. Um, but these are often recorded as well, as you can see here. School dentist. Oh gosh, I'm sure we all remember the school dentist. How many of us have got phobias because of the school dentist today? Um, especially those of us who are lucky enough to remember the foot-driven dental drills. Oh, shiver down my spine even now. Um, you know, but you know, again, we forget at the time. You know, this was a good way of making sure children were a lot more healthy. Common diseases. Annual flu season far more serious than it is today could devastate school attendances. Um, as you can see in this one, look at the attendances goes down from 89%, 77%, 53% before it starts to get better. Um, this is all due to influenza, again, no, which, which was terrible, easily can passed on, easily contagious. Whooping cough, again, known as portusis, it's a bacterial infection of the lungs just contagious, easily spread from the cough. And this one actually records a school that was closed. So if you look on the left-hand side there, March 1912, Friday, children there with whooping cough. Um, they got visitor from the, from the vicar, and then the school was closed for three weeks under medical authority. So they decided it was so contagious, they had to close the school. Um, Again, happened time and time again. Um, you know, that was in obviously in March. By April, the school's back open again. But even so, Monday 1st of April, the attendance slightly better, but many children are away because they whoop. They have the whoop from the whooping cough. Scarlet fever, um, disease caused by a streptococcus infection spread by coughing and sneezing. Um, before antibiotics, it was a leading cause of death in children. This is two entries from a school. One school saying, you know, two children of scarlet fever have been removed to the isolation hospital. Um, and then a the, the few days, a few months later, days later, actually, on Wednesday, I was compelled to exclude Margaret Buggins as a suspected case of scarlet fever. This was one I remember quite dramatically. I had scarlet fever as a child, uh, and uh, my granddad gave my dad ten pounds. And my granddad said, to him, "What's this for?" And the granddad said, "Oh, it's to pay for his funeral." You know, he was convinced I was going to die because I had scarlet fever. Of course, when my granddad was this age, he was sort of you know, he'd have been ten, like nineteen hundred. Um, it was a fatal, could be a fatal condition. Um, serious outbreaks often occurred uh, the schools could be closed and deep cleaned, disinfected and this is an example of one school the school has today been disinfected by order of the sanitary inspector in accordance with the an request made by the chairman of the managers the school managers chickenpox and measles again very common um, again it could devastate school attendances um, the bottom was especially interesting here attendance has been very low all the week 19 children out of 24 are absent with measles so chickenpox and measles very common illnesses you know often take took pupils away bit of a more scary one diphtheria this is a bacterial infection affects the nose and the throat very rare but was once very common um typically the third leading cause of death in children and and they could cause great concern and this is uh, entry from a school case of diphtheria in the parish not a school child but four children from the same home excluded from school um you know so they were that worried about it they actually closed 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 these excluded these school people pupils from the school because just the threat of it um this school lots of diseases here in one go attendance very low owing to a lot of illness among the children and then you get epidemics of whooping cough scarlet fever influenza you know that's a, you know all those three at the same time going on must have been quite scary for the whole village 
occasionally you do get sad of things so this is a very sad entry headmasters recorded it is with feelings of regret that i record the death of jose scriven she was present on october the 4th and was less on left us on pack day and has now passed away the cause of her death was blood poisoning so occasionally children did did die very sad Um, staff changes. Logbooks generally record staff changes, but nor was in nor was in good detail. This again from Amni Crucess, which was a good, a great example for school logbooks, really. This gives you an idea of Miss May Roberts, who started work, and it gives you her uh, particulars and where she came from, her age, and things, and uh, how she qualified. So sometimes you get this information, other times you just get new teacher, John Smith, etc. Started today. Special events, these often crop up as well. Um, this is interesting. Well, this is box one later to the school. Um, reopened after a whole summer, ho summer holidays. The piano has been taken away during the holidays. There's no mention is made of its return. Why they took it away, we don't know. Were the choir that bad? Well, in time will we'll never tell us, will it? This is a nice one. This is from saying Boxwell and later to school. The headmistress recorded this entry in 1916. The children all went to see an airplane which had dropped in a field nearby. Registers were not marked. So you can imagine how exciting that must have been in 1916 to see an airplane land in a field. Um, it's the middle of the war, so this airplane comes down. Wow, the kids must have been so excited. I mean, I love airplanes now. If I hear an airplane going ahead, I'm always going to have a look at it. So back then, when it was rare, imagine the shock and surprise. It became really common. 1918, the Australian Flying Corps opened a base at Leighton, so they're around all over the place. But the headmistress restrained herself. Contrast this this school with Renkham. In 1916, the Royal Flying Corps opened an airfield at Renkham on a little scarp above the village school, literally 100 feet below was village school. The headmaster here never once mentioned an airplane or the aerodrome or even the war. And there have been airplanes flying all day long overhead. So, you know, just to show you how different heads took sort of the view of what to record, what not to record. Um, Christchurch School in Cheltenham sat next to a bridge over the railway line to St James's Station. So there are steam trains going in and out all day. Um, the headmaster here um, on the 5th forbade the boys getting on the railway bridge on the walls to watch it. And have a look at the picture there. You can see the school, you can see the lines, you can see the bridge. Um, on the 7th, the same month, just a couple of days later, had to punish three boys for getting on the bridge and three for staying in the playground. Um, it was a after her after good goodbye at school afternoon so imagine this i mean i'll be terrible at this school i'll be listening to the trains all day long i'm bad enough at work uh, this is a nice little stove here um have a look at this one the start off on the 24th of march 1914. So here we go. A very unpleasant day. I went to the fluent stove being choked in the room full of smoke. That must have been a really tough day at school, wasn't it? Especially in March. You can have the fire going all day, but being full. But luckily, you know, the next day the blacksmith put the stove right. So everything was right and good with the world. Um, bonfire night does crop up, not all the time. Um, this is one from the school. If you notice, it's a Sarasester school, but at the bottom there we have. Mr. Fred Cripps visited and brought a large parcel of fireworks. These will be let off this evening at 6 p.m. So, you know, it, it was done. There was a little bit of entertainment for children. Um, looking at the punishment and punishment books, um, corporal punishment derives from the Latin word for the body, corpus. Um, and it could be very harsh. In late Tudor times, when 14 year old apprentices in Gloucestershire, in Gloucestershire they had his testicles cut off for displaying his master. We've yet to locate that one in, in the sort of the books, in the red books of Gloucestershire Borough Council, um, of Gloucester Borough, I should say. But we, we'll be there and we will find it because this is a really interesting one. I'd like to read about this one. Um, most common instrument, the rat and cane. I'm sure we remember Jimmy Edwards there as wacko, of course, of the BBC. Um, there's another collection, connection with Gloucestershire and Jimmy Edwards as well. Um, he played the trombone very well and he also flew Dakotas out of RAF Fairford in the war. So again, you know, and I remember that that, that programme from the television, I'm sure most of you do. Um, however, Parliament outlawed corporal punishment, 1986, a bit later in private schools. 
not the only thing you could do. You can shame your pupils. And you go at the bottom of this one. Um, seven boys shamed before the school for playing with fire last evening in the village street. You know, I remember that happening at my school, not fire on the street, but I remember kids being brought out and told they'd done something wrong in front of the school. So it was not quite as bad as that, but it did happen. Um, the Education Act 1907 set up lots of systems for school, uh, many related to health of the children, and among them was that every school had to, by law, have a punishment book, and all cases of corporal punishment had to be recorded in that book. So you can see, even by this time, there was a bit of concern about sort of the, let's say, the, um, the enthusiasm with which some 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 teachers punish children. These are the books that are closed. I've chosen books that are actually open for us to look at in, the, in this talk. So I'll give you an idea of what they were. So this is a typical one. You see an entry, the date, the name, um, what class the person who's been punished in, the nature of the offence and the punishment and the teacher who did it. So we have a look at the top. 6th of February, 1908, Bolton, Fred. Class two, disobedience, two strikes of the cane. Poor old Fred crossed up a few times, but beneath Fred on the second line, Rose Baldwin, disobedience. Um, and the names do crop up time and time again. You do get sort of uh, a few cropping up. Yeah, obviously, they're the bad boys. Um, but look at the bottom here. Violet Herkham striking a child in the playground. One slap, which on, one slap on a hand on her arm. So, you know, teachers have to record all this detail. And I'll move on to another one here. Again, lots of things, defiance, dis disobedience. Um, I felt sorry here for Watts, Bristow and Palfrey. Um, their punishment, well, apart from repeated disobedience, they were eating apples in school against orders. That's a bit tough, isn't it, you know? Um, but Mr. Prosser there, using obscene language in the playground, four strokes. Thing. And then, you know, the one at the very bottom of this image, E. Cox, impudence, brackets, laughing. That is one that's always going to get a teacher annoyed, isn't it? Um, different school here. Um, this is one that's got a little bit more detail. Um, and again, you have to make a little snigger at this one in a way. Um, Ernest Fitter and James Hyatt here came to school one hour late sheep driving without parents consent <laughs> they got six strikes on the buttocks and one on each hand so it's quite a severe punishment um and then you know sort of mr ed william edgington here during drill made a noise was asked to come and say why he did it did nothing but yell loudly <laughs> again. but again um james high at the bottom here his offence knocked an apple out of a boy's hand and started to eat the same. And the teacher has put briefly a case of theft, which I think is quite funny. But again, quite a severe punishment. Four strikes on the hand and three on the buttocks. So you're glad this sort of stuff is gone, really. Um, and we come to John William Prattley here. Um, and I'll let you have a look at that. There's a transcript underneath it if you want to read it. So, using disgusting language and throwing mud over the two mistresses outside school on several occasions after repeated warnings, four strikes on the hand, but the heads thought this isn't enough. So he's written here, a thoroughly bad boy in every sense, almost hopeless, not fit to associate with the other children. He probably went on to be a politician or something, didn't he? But yeah, so the punishment books do exist. There are not many. So by and large, this was quite rare to have all these sort of punishments, it has to be said. So that's the end of my talk. Um, oh, there we go. It's jumping around again now. Come back. There we go. Um, we're going to take some questions. Um, please use the Zoom chat for you to do this and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, if you want to look for more of these talks, we are going to be keeping them going. Um, so have a look at our website. You can see the address there. That's our email address. If you've got any questions that you know you don't get a chance to answer today. I hope you've enjoyed this little talk um, and say so please do come and watch us again. Thank you very much for listening.